Yo, Counter-Attack Podcast for myself, Daps. Guys, keep liking, subscribing, sharing, all that good stuff. Um, I'm back. Back and I'm better. For, oh gosh. So I didn't release something this week. Um, I wasn't about, but I'm back now. So we're back for... Someone in the comments put how many videos I should release this week. For those of you listening via Spotify or whatever... Go to YouTube because I do release a lot more on YouTube than I do on audio. I'm going to give you this one on audio because I feel like there's quite a bit to talk about. But um, yeah, guys, get like, subscribe and sharing, all that good stuff. And um, yeah, where do we start? Let's start with Man United because that was the game that was on today. And um, today was one of those games where I was just like, do you know what? Man United are a team who don't, who don't like close out? So I feel like I've got something on that. Anyway, Man United are a team who don't really. They play well in spells, in like spells in matches, and um, and Luton are a team where you just got to be bang on it because they will keep coming at you, keep coming at you, and make it really difficult for you to play your game. So that's a game where you really got to go in and you really got to be on job. And this United team isn't a team that that does that. Like I say, they play well in spells. They've got enough individual talent at times to get over the line. And um, I, I just felt like this would be a tricky one for them. But also, United, when it comes to these teams, these are the teams that, you know, they kind of genuinely, um, generally beat. You know, the ones t- towards the bottom end of the table, they might struggle, but they'll beat them. So I did think United would win this game. But equally, I thought that it's touch and go where it could just easily just swing the other way and, and be a loot and win. And, you know, obviously they got off to a great start. Hoyland gets his goal and and Hoyland, listen, I always say this is why it's good that I do a podcast so you lot can hold me accountable for for the things that I say. I did say Hoyland looks good and once he gets settled, he will score goals. And I think with Hoyland, for me, he, if he's, if Hoyland is brought up in a good team is if he's surrounded with players in these years where he's growing and learning his trade if he's surrounded with players that can actually give him the ball and and get the best out of him honestly United might have actually just got a top striker on their hand because I don't know what his current goal scoring record is I think it's like seven and five or something like that seven and six um someone can correct me but he's bang on it and even his second goal today where it just comes off the shoulder like that's just that's just it just shows where he's at right now where, where everything he touches just goes in and you know he's got his scoring boots on and like I said is if he actually gets gets into the position with this Man United team where they actually help set him up when you look at his goals people aren't really setting him up properly he's always like feeding off scraps or just making something happen out of nothing again today it happened both goals so like with, with Amari Bell Murray Bell making the mistake and him just going through and, and, and scoring a second one um, deflected shot. But yeah, he, he can go on and, and be really, really good. He's got that thing about him where it's just, he's got power, he's got strength. His finishing looks like it's all right. And like I said, it just depends on where he goes with this United team because as right, like right now he's scoring, but that could easily go the other way where, you know, he goes through droughts because... His teammates ain't helping him. He's having to do it all alone. And having to do it all alone whilst you're still learning the game, it's it's almost an impossible task as we saw earlier on in earlier on in the season. But you know, United are playing well right now. Oh, I wouldn't say playing well, but they're doing better, they're doing good enough where the load is off him. And now he's able to like concentrate on just getting the goals. And obviously he's got the confidence as well. So um that definitely helps. But today, like, I don't know what it is about United. Manchester United do this thing where they'll play well in spells, like I said, like five, ten minute spells. They're just really, really good. And then for whatever reason, they just take their foot off the gas and the other team comes back in. As you saw with um, Luton when Carlton Morris gets his goal and then all of a sudden United just looked like a bad team. And in that first half, it could have easily gone 2-2, should have easily had a player sent off. And I don't know how... First of all, Casemiro should have got a yellow card before he got his yellow card. That's number one. Number two, that that second foul was probably the worst of all the tackles he did. And yet, 
and it was right in front of the referee. And I just don't know how he just didn't get a second yellow. And, you know, it's no wonder why Ten Hag took him off because he 100% would have got a red because one more tackle, no matter how bad or not serious or whatever it was, one more tackle and he was gone. So United definitely got away with that one. And if I'm the Luton boss, if I'm the Luton players, I'm looking at that thinking, yo, like what just happened there? We'd, we've been robbed of the opportunity of playing against 10 men because he should have had a sending off. You know, Maguire coming off at half time as well um, because he 100% would have got sent off as well. I think in that first half, he committed three, maybe four fouls in that first half alone, was on a yellow card. And the way Luton were playing, he was always going to be isolated. He was always going to give away another fight in that game. So they took him off. But I actually think, and people might think I'm, I'm mad for saying this, but I actually think Johnny Evans is better than Maguire. When people talk about Johnny Evans, ah, oh, Johnny Evans, Johnny Evans, I don't get it because if you're looking for a solid defender, no thrills, no nothing, just straight defending, Johnny Evans is your man. But obviously he's now, what, 35, I think he is. So that is what plays, you know, negatively in his part. But Johnny Evans is a good player. And when he came on, all of a sudden, in those instances when they get encountered, in those instances when you've got to come up the um, the pitch and, and get tight, like, Johnny Evans is much better in those positions. One-on-one -on -one defending, Johnny Evans is much better. Um, so Maguire going off and Johnny Evans coming in, it wasn't a bad move at all. If Johnny Evans was, how, well, if Johnny Evans was, let's say 26, 27 years old, he probably won the be one, he'd probably be one of the best defenders in the country. And I'm not even trying to be funny when I say that. Or maybe I'll just rate Johnny Evans a bit too a bit too highly. But Evans is a really, really good defender. So when people, whenever people talk dirt on him, I'm always just like, hold on. Evans is probably better than most defenders that we rate now. But we don't want to have that conversation. But anyway, um, Luke Shaw's obviously gone off again. And United, I think right now, they're, 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 in a, they're at a point where they're lucky that the top five are getting um is getting champ oh, is the top five are getting Champions League this year because it gives them an opportunity to get that spot whilst not having a great season at all whilst playing badly and losing all these games like they're still within touching distance of Champions League which is obviously where they want to be they want to be challenging but right now where they are they can't challenge so it's you just got to look at Champions League football and um I do also want to talk about. Mm, very quickly, Lokonga. I spoke about Lokonga the other week in, and said he's found a team where he's um, he's able to just really show his abilities. But now, I mean, not now, but I, I think when I looked, at, when I when I was watching today's game and I saw Lokonga, between him and Mainu, him and Mainu were the best midfielders on the pitch all day long. And a lot of the talk going into the game was focused on Ross Barkley and this is his his time to um, to really show what he can do and whatever against a, a top team and and show that that's that's the level that he belongs but the two people that that stood out in that game were Mainu and Lokonga. Lokonga for me edged it I think Lokonga was probably Lokonga might have been the best player on the pitch Lokonga might have been the best player on the pitch against Man United and he literally legit bossed everything in the on, on that pitch. The, like I said, the only one that come close was Mainu. Mainu is the only one out of all of the midfielders that they have, no matter how old they are, who has any sort of composure. He's got composure, he's got finesse, he's got, he's just got that thing about him where he's always in control. He doesn't let the pressure get to him. Even when he has to make them last ditch tackles, which he got booked for, which should never have been a booking, should never have even been a foul. Um, he just doesn't ever look flustered. So I saw someone, I think it was um, Secret Scout saying that Gareth Southgate should be looking at Mainu and and I'm of the, I'm one of those that's like, let them play. But if you're good enough, you're good enough. And he's good enough. When you look at the options that they have, what Mainu is showing right now is, is the ability to actually play at a higher level. I'm not saying he's there yet in terms of the finished product because he's not. And you can see sometimes when he plays, but... Listen, the maturity that he plays with is second to none. He can spot a pass. He can sniff out danger. He can just, he knows that he's just always got a cool head about him. And I said it the other week that he just reminds me of Clarence Sadoff in that nature. Not more with how he plays, but he's just got that 
air of Sadoff in him. Not and again, I'm not comparing the two because if he if he achieves half of what Sadoff did, then he's gonna be some player. We know he's not there yet, but um, yeah, that was um, a good game. So Lukonga, Mainu, best players on the pitch. It's a shame that Luton were missing Adebayo, who had to pull out in the um, in the warm up, but because that would have been so that would have been a different kind of problem because Luton were knocking crosses into the box all day long, but. United dealt with them relatively easily, um, I felt. So, I think that's it. But yeah, United got the win. Luton should feel hard done by because I do feel like they deserved a draw, at least. But then again, you can look at the chances that Man United missed and the amount of saves that Kaminsky had to make and say that on another day, they would have gone away and won that game 3-4-1. So, yeah, that's United. <laughs> Let me know what you think in the comments, as always, about what I've been saying about Maino and Lokonga. I'm just getting my notes to say what to see what I'm going to say to you guys. Casemiro should have been sent off. United don't know how to close out games. They don't. They always let teams back in. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Right. City versus Chelsea. City versus Chelsea was a good game to watch. I heard Gary Neville on... Um, Stick to Football, the show on YouTube. If you guys need a football show to watch, watch Stick to Football on YouTube. It's Gary Neville, Jamie Carragher, uh, Jill Scott, Roy Keane and Ian Wright. And it's so funny. Some of the stories you hear them talk about. Listen, Stick to Football, just tap that in YouTube and enjoy. Um, but he was saying on Stick to Football that he finds Man City quite boring. And for me, he said they just don't... When he watched it, he just finds it really, really boring. Just... You know, they just control the game too much. And, and and for me, that is that is not boring. I think the ability to control a game the way they do, the ability to know where, ex where every player should be in order to sniff out danger in case the ball gets turned over, like it's an art form. You don't just control games like easily the way they do. No matter who they're playing, they dominate possession, they tire the defence out and then they go for the kill. Like it's just... Every, every bit of it is just so methodical and I love seeing it. I don't find it boring at all. I th so, so, when you look at what Chelsea did against Man City, against, um, against Arsenal earlier in, in, the, in the season, and you see how they can play, when they go and do um, performances like they did against Crystal Palace in the first half, like they did against Wolves, um, you're just thinking, what the heck is going on here? Because there's, there's obviously the players there to actually do it, um, to actually play well. And when you when you look at how they dealt with City in regards to... With City, a lot of the time, teams go there and they're, and they're defeated before they already start the game. The way they set up, they're just defeated. Whereas Chelsea didn't do the whole, just let's just sit in and try our hardest to just soak up as much pressure as we can. No, they came out and they knew... When they're in possession, they've got to make it count. They've got to get from back to front as quick as possible. And I would say counter-attack, but it wasn't just about counter-attacking. It was just being quicker and playing with urgency and getting players with enough speed and pace, like, in behind, which is what happened. And, you know, they were able to isolate certain Man City players and catch them out of position. So you had bits where, you know, the ball goes up to Nicholas Jackson. Nicholas Jackson... He's able to control it and Cole Palmer is gone and the ball will get there. And all of a sudden, Man City go from defending to now having to run back and attack. And I mean, they go from attacking, sorry, to now having to run back and defend in a way where it's like players are out of position because Chelsea haven't been sluggish in, in, their, um, in their transition. You know what I mean? So I, I don't, I don't, I'm sounding like I'm all over the place, but I know what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Whereas normally, teams come, they get the ball, it's almost like, uh, launch it forward, try running behind, they deal with it, and it comes to nothing. But in the first half, like they were in a couple of times. Sterling should have had, I think, two. He should have got at least two goals. And, and um, they played, yeah, they, they, they played that game really, really well. But then, obviously, City in the second half just come back and just do what City, just do what City do. And they deserve, City deserve to win. If they had won that game, we would have looked and thought, yeah, they deserved that because they created enough chances. Haaland should have, 
Harlan should have had enough goals. Like he, sh- he had enough chances to at least get two two goals yesterday. I'm talking about real good chances. Um, I think though. Oh, what are we doing, Foden? Listen, I didn't record last week, so all of that talk on Foden and Saka, I missed out on. But all I'm gonna say on the whole Foden world class stuff is that he's not world class. He's a very, very good player. And when we talk about Foden, we talk about his talent. And if we're going to talk about his talent, I hold my hands up. But you can't call him world class because, you know, he'll go and he'll go, he'll get into form against teams that, you know, City should be beating, teams that he should be showing up against. But too many times in the games that really matter, in the games at the highest level, Foden doesn't boss it. Foden doesn't show up in those games. And it's not his fault. It's not his fault. That's not me saying he's rubbish. I'm just trying to offer a reason as to why he can't be world class. And I'm sure Foden will probably say, say that he's not world class. You can't have a player like KDB who's obviously world class and then also put Foden in the same breath. Like it doesn't make sense. Talk about his potential all you like. Talk about his his talent all you like. But we have to be real when it comes to what we actually see. Because too many times we see Foden just go missing, doesn't get into England team, doesn't walk into England team, you know, with all of the, the, the talent that he has. He doesn't walk into the City team with all of the talent that he has. Now he is because he's on form and I get that. But no, like, let him get there. I think when he starts contributing to games in a way, in, in the game that really matter, yes, he's, he's, he's going to contribute against Copenhagen and against teams in the bottom half of the table. Yes, he's going to have good games. He might even play good, he might even have good games against teams in the top half of the table, that top team. But what I'm trying to say is that until he bosses it, until he shows up time and time again in those moments when the team really needs him, like, you can't call him world class. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. KDB was out injured however long. Man City needed him against Newcastle. He came, turned turned the game on its head, scored one, set up one. That is what KDB does. That is a world-class player there. So I think we just have to just be sensible when we do the whole world-class talk. Saka. See Saka. The reason why I take Saka over Foden, not because I'm an Arsenal fan, but it's because in terms of effectiveness, Saka is so effective all the time. Even if he's having an an off game, he is effective. Do you get what I'm saying? Saka is the difference a lot of the time for Arsenal. Foden is not the difference. And I think that's the that's the major thing as well. Like you have to be a difference maker. You have to do it time and time again on the biggest stage in the biggest games. Saka, he has he has good moments in the biggest games, but he hasn't shown it on the biggest stage. And I'm it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't take away from his ability, it doesn't take away from his talent, it doesn't take away from how good he is. But we have to just stop calling players world class when they're not world class. And Foden is not world class. You let me know what you think because whenever I say that it was the same thing with Harry Kane when I said he wasn't world class because you have to be the difference in those games that really matter. But people are saying I hate Kane. Listen, I've got nothing but love for Foden. Love watching Foden play. Proper player. But it's okay to say he's not world class. And I'm not even about to get into this all, um, again because every time I mention Kane, the same with Trent. Like, it's good. It's good. But we're all good. Let me know what you think anyway. But um, City drop points. I don't think... I mean, obviously, at this point in the season, if you're Arsenal or Liverpool, you want City to drop as many points as possible. So it's a good thing in that perspective. But I don't think anyone walked away thinking, oh my gosh, City, you're finished. Because if that was Arsenal at drop points, they'd be like, oh, you're out of the race. You're out of the race. But um, fair play. Rodri is a clutch player. We talk about Rodri all the time. Well, I talk about Rodri in regards to how he just controls that midfield and sets the tempo for that. Um, he gets things going for, for Man City. And he's, the mist, he's Mr. Reliable. That team, as much as there's all of the talent, as much as there's all of the, the game IQ and all of the experience on that pitch, it doesn't tick without Rodri. It just doesn't. And the fact that Rodri, once again, showed that he's just able to show up in those moments when City are struggling, he gets the goal against Chelsea, the difference. Like, it just goes to show, like, the, the level of player that, that we're, we're talking about. So I just wanted to just highlight that, man, and just talk about just, just how good that player is right there. Um, yes, 
Is that is that it for Ch- Chelsea? Uh, the Sassy Colwell partnership. I'm not a fan of. Co- it's not that I'm not a fan of Colwell. I think Colwell's overhyped. I think, I think he shows his his inexperience quite a bit, and he can be got at quite a bit. I think to Sassy, that's probably his best game that I've seen for Chelsea. He was really really good yesterday. Can't lie. I'm not even gonna. The Sassy was really really good. Um, snuffed out everything. I heard Gary Neville say that when Thiago's not in the team, it allows them to defend much more aggressively. And I hear it. When Thiago's in the team, you've got to play to his strengths and not to the team's strengths. Whereas with these two in, in the middle, they can go out, they can be aggressive. It don't matter if they're if they're caught one one v one and isolated or someone's running in behind them. Um, because you know that they can probably keep up and, and deal with it. Whereas when Thiago's in the team, what he adds, you also take away. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, they played really, really well. And you know what? I like Petrovic, you know. I know Sanchez is probably coming back next week. But that Petrovic keeper, he's he looks, he does his job. He does his job. And that's the most important thing for me. That, um, a goalkeeper that just does their job. He won't set the world alight with his distribution. He won't set the world alight with, with crazy saves. But he does the job and does it to a very good level. And I don't know where they got Petrovic from, but he looks like a capable keeper and one that they should really go on and just push with and pursue with. So, um, yeah, unlucky Sanchez for me anyway. He's better than Sanchez. Cool. Um, Yes, that's it for Chelsea. That's it for the Chelsea and um, Man City game. Obviously, we've got to go into Arsenal. Burnley versus Arsenal. I knew Arsenal would win this game. Um, off the back of West Ham, you just look at since Arsenal have come back from that break that they had, they've looked really good. They've looked really, really good. The players have looked rested. They've looked like they they know exactly what they're doing. And and earlier on, I spoke about how um, Man City control games, but Arsenal are in this mode where they're really controlling games. Arsenal are in this mode where Obviously, they have the best defence in the league right now. And it's by no coincidence. And earlier in the season, Arteta made Arsenal so resolute, made them defensively sound, but it impacted the attack where we weren't scoring. There was no balance there. Whereas now the balance is right where we're defending well, we're not conceding, but now we're also scoring goals. So the balance is right there. And um, of listen, there's a reason why in terms of the attack, once Odegaard is now back on it, and I don't know if something's been tweaked or... You know what it is? I honestly believe that there's been something said to get him the that the football, get him the ball, pass him the ball in the correct areas and, and in a timely fashion, as quickly as possible. Because now we're seeing that all of a sudden it looks like he's got space on the ball. Now he's able to operate in areas of the pitch where he can do the most damage. And we've seen him get forward against Burnley after, what, four or five minutes, however however long, bang, goal. We've seen him set up, who did he set up? Saka, Saka's second goal. He was, he's just creating chances, he's dictating play now. And, and it's because of where he's able to pick up the ball. So, you know, all this talk about Declan Rice not being able to, Declan Rice still got a long way to go in order to be as good as I would like him to be, but he's still good at it. And now you can see that he's starting to pass the ball forward. And it's like he's evolving as a player because we have to remember that Declan Rice is still young. He's still a young player. So his play can still be evolved. He's still not peaked. So, um, yeah, that that's good. Saka, what can I say about Saka, man? Like, four goals in his last two games. He's well and truly back. He's, he needed that rest. And he looks like, a player that's just been rejuvenated and is just ready to play. And players are still dub- doubling up on him, but he looks like he's found a way to still create space, still get into positions where he's um, where he's causing problems and able to get into those goal-scoring positions again. And, you know, for a while, people were talking dirt and saying crazy things about Saka because he was, he was, he was off form. The first time we've ever really seen him off form for a longer a long period since we've seen him come into the team. But now that he's back, people are just keeping quiet again, rightly so. I think it shows that when players are off form, it's okay to say they're off form 
but it's not okay to call them finished and all of that stuff. I say it all the time, right? People are just so quick to just write off players when right now he's looking like one of the best players in the league. Well, he is one of the best players in the league and now he's actually showing it and backing it up. So fair, fair, play, to, fair play to him. Havertz. You see Havertz? Havertz was one of the best players on the pitch and he deserved his goal. His third man runs and it's interesting seeing it because it's like before he would get into the box but kind of linger, languish over there. Whereas now he's he's literally like, pff, just darting in there, third man run, making those runs. And he was so difficult to pick up. It's happened a good three, four times where it was causing problems. And what I also like about him is that he's he's just picking up good positions in general and he's he's making good use of the ball. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, and he looks like he's got a bit of energy about him. That laziness that, that we saw earlier in the season, it's not quite there anymore. And we, we've seen that he's got that, that energy. So um, he deserved his goal. He was really, really good. Burnley are in trouble because I can't see where their win comes from. I, I honestly can't see. I can't see that. I can't see enough about the way that they play that there's enough enough there to to get some results maybe i might be wrong but no i can't i can't really see it to be honest um big up the defense big up david raya raya came for came in for a lot of criticism when he came in me must me as well i criticized him because i didn't think he was better than aaron ramsdale i didn't think aaron ramsdale did enough to be dropped the way he was dropped i felt like david raya came in didn't really look any better didn't really look like the play we saw at Brentford, but I felt like that was also Arteta's fault. But um, yeah, in the last couple of games we've seen him, or no, a bit longer in the last couple of games, he's looked good. He's looked assured. That might also be because we're not really getting peppered with shots. He's not really having to do a lot of work because we are defending so well. But whenever he is called into action, he's doing his job. So fair play to him, man. Uh, I think that might be it. Shout out to, to Jacob Kirio as well. What else is there? I think that's it, you know. Uh, Tuchel. Pff, don't know what's going on there. Tuchel. Thomas Tuchel is that manager that comes in and he's amazing with that new manager bounce. When there's that new manager bounce, he knows all the right things to do. You know, he's got the, the coaching license where, you know, he's got all of these new ideas and whatever. You know, the UEFA A, whatever it is, he's got all of that. But the moment that that new manager bounce wears off and he's actually got some work to do, it's like he just doesn't find the answers. It's like, in theory, he, it's, I can imagine he goes home looking at his book of all the plays and all the tactics and then thinks... But why are they not doing this? Do you know what I mean? And and um, he'll look at the game and he's able to like interpret what went wrong, but then how to implement the things that he wants, how to deal with big characters. I don't think he can he can do it because Bayern Munich are playing really, really bad right now and the players just aren't responding to him. The players just aren't... Re you can see it's, it's almost like the players are just looking at him thinking, All right, hurry up and get sacked because we're done, man. Let's, let's just write off this season because if they just about... If they win this season, he's going to be lucky. Last season, they just about won it. Um, they don't like that. Considering before him, they're winning it at ease pretty much every season. You know, he's, he's in big trouble. He says he won't quit, but they, they're probably going to get rid of him beforehand. Especially if they don't overturn that 1-0 um, that deficit from, the, from um, the Champions League. So, it'll be interesting to see what he does. Pedro Neto, listen... I've been saying for the last year to 18 months, get Pedro Neto in if you're Arsenal. Even if you're not Arsenal, Pedro Neto should be near enough the top of everyone's list who's looking for a winger because what he does, and that's normal what we saw him do against Tottenham, to be able to run with the ball at speed from defence to attack all the time for 19... <laughs>